Good morning to all of you. We're very, very thankful for your presence. We remind you, if you will, if you have not already, to take a moment to turn off your cell phones. We want to be focused on what we're doing together this morning. We're glad that you're here. We have gathered together to worship our Father in heaven. If you're visiting with us, we're especially thankful for your presence. We invite you to take a moment to fill out a visitor's card that should be very close to you, hopefully beneath or in front of the, uh, on the row of chairs in front of you. Take a moment to fill that out if you would, and you'll have the opportunity toward the end of our services to place those in a basket. We're very thankful for your presence. We want to do our best on this last Sunday morning of the year to set aside all of the different things that so easily occupy our minds and distract us and focus on what matters most, on who matters most. In Revelation chapter 19, John records how he heard a a triumphant call to praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. And then John writes, I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. We not only want to engage our our lungs and our mouths, but our hearts most of all in singing praise to God. And we start out this morning with number 434, all hail the power of Jesus' name. We'll sing all four verses. All hail the power of Jesus' name. supplements, the greatest commands. We'll sing all four verses and we will sing the fourth verse 
twice all together. We start out with our altos. In verse 2, we add our basses. Verse 3, we add our tenors. Verse 4, we add our sopranos. And we will sing it a fifth time all together. Number 64, the greatest commands. Love one another Dear Holy and Righteous Father in Heaven, we come before your great presence this morning. We're thankful, Lord, for this assembly, this number of people that have come together for the purpose of offering up reverence and respect to your most holy name. We're thankful, Lord, for your great holiness and your great love, your grace, your compassion and being able to provide a way of salvation so that we through Jesus might be right with you. We're thankful Lord for Jesus and his willingness to come down to this sin cursed earth to, to willingly offer up his life as that lamb and that sacrifice for our sins. We're thankful Lord for this time of worship that Together we can edify and encourage each other that we can study your word together and we just pray, Lord, your blessings upon us as we learn this morning more of the truth of your word. We 
pray that you'll be with Nathan as he presents your word, and, and we just pray, Lord, that as hearers we will be attentive, we will search those scriptures, and that as a result of being here this morning, our faith will be built up. We're thankful, Lord, for each member here that works and labors in this community, in this area, and, and is a part of this body that makes this body work. And we're thankful, Lord, for the efforts and the good deeds that many here have done and the examples that we have before us. Help us, Lord, to be using these things as instruments to lead the lost to Christ. We just pray, Lord, that as a congregation here, you will bless us in our efforts to, to preach your word and to continue to build your, your members here on this earth through you adding them to the church. We're thankful, Lord, that through our obedience, we were able to obtain access to your great grace. We pray, Lord, that you would look down upon us in tender mercy and forgive us of our sins. And we pray, Lord, that all things will be done to your glory. And it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you're using a songbook and would like to mark it, we will use number 385 as a song of encouragement following Nathan's lesson. Before that, we will sing number 17, The Lord is My Light. Nathan is talking this morning from God's Word about the fact that we are not in control, but reminding us who is. And this song, inspired by Psalm 27, encourages us to wait on the Lord. We'll sing both verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? And He is my strength, the defense of my life, whom shall I
you are not in control. Yes, you may have gotten ready this morning and drove here in your car. And you were the one who was in control of that car, weren't you? You go to work during the week and you get that paycheck at the end of two. And you decide what you buy with your money. You control what TV shows you watch, what movies you go to see, what you do for your entertainment. You're in control of your free time. You are in control of everything in your life. But I'm here to tell you, you are not in control. I have my Bible open to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 29 and verse 11. We'll be spending the most of our time together here in Jeremiah 29. In verse 11... He says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. What a verse. What a piece of scripture that can give us strength. This verse right here can give us optimism, give us hope and confidence. God has a plan for us. But listen to me. We cannot take this single verse out of its context and applied to our lives. We have to look at the verses before it, and especially the verses that come after it. Jeremiah is sending this letter to the people in exile, and these weren't just ordinary people. This is the people of God. This is the Israelites. They had lost their land. They had lost their kingdom. They had lost their temple. Jerusalem was gone. They were forced to walk 800 miles to Babylon a city filled with pagan gods and idolatry. These people did not know the God like they did. How do you think they felt at that moment? They look back and everything is gone. Jerusalem was gone. They had lost everything. Have you ever felt that way? At the very bottom of your life, Physically, emotionally, most of all spiritually. One thing you realize very quickly is that you are not in control. God is. Those who are the created do not have power over the creator. God is the one who spoke this world, this life into existence, not you. What what attitude we must have to think that our wisdom outplays the wisdom of God. That is foolish. Jeremiah 23, 24, Can a man hide himself in secret places so that I cannot see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? Jeremiah 32 and verse 27, Behold, I am the Lord. I am the God of all flesh. I am the one that spoke you into existence. I am the one that spoke this world into existence. I am the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? This is the God that fills the earth. This is the God that nothing nothing is too hard for him. We have to realize that we are not in control. God is. In Jeremiah 29... We're not facing the same trials that they are facing. But man hasn't changed much since then. We can still feel hopeless, can't we? We can still feel discouraged at times. We can still feel alone. But trusting in God was something they had to do. They had to be told to their face how to do that. And after all, if God is for us, who can be against us? You are not in control. God is. And because God is in control, we need to understand that we are not. And our actions need to reflect that. Go back to our verse in Jeremiah 29 and verse 11. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11 where it says, For I know the plans you have for yourself. That's not what that verse says. 
For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. We cannot go through life with the attitude and with the actions that we are going to say and do what we want. We just talked about it in our class this morning. We talked about bringing holiness to completion. We cannot spit in the face of God and say, I'm going to do what we want. That is not the way he designed us. That is not his purpose. That is not his plan for us. And that's exactly the attitude that got the people of Israel into exile. Go with me to Jeremiah 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. We'll start reading in verse 3. Jeremiah 25, verses 3 through 11. For 23 years, from the 13th year of Josiah, the son of Ammon, king of Judah, to this day, 23 years, the word of the Lord has come to me, and I have spoken persistently for 23 years to you. But you have not listened. You have neither listened nor inclined your ears to hear, although the Lord persistently sent to you all his servants, the prophets, saying, Turn now every one of you from his evil way and evil deeds, and dwell upon the land that the Lord has given to you and your fathers from of old and forever. Do not go after other gods to serve and worship them, or provoke me to anger with the work of your hands. Then I will do you no harm. Yet you have not listened to me, in verse 7. Twenty-three years you have not listened to me. That you might provoke me to anger with the work of your hands to your own harm. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, because you have not obeyed my words, behold, I will send for you all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord. And for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants, and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction. I will make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Moreover, I will banish from them the voice of mirth, and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, and the voice of the bride, the grinding of the millstones and the light of the lamp. This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. These Israelites were taken away from their homes. They were sent into captivity, killed. They had lost everything because of their own actions. They had the attitude that they were in control of their life. How far from the truth. In the book of James... He warns of this very same attitude. James chapter 4, verses 13 through 16. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Who are we to believe that we are a match against God's strength and God's power? Who are we to believe that we can fight against God's will? We are a broken people. We are absolutely lost. The Apostle Paul exclaimed in Romans Chapter 7 and verse 24, wretched man that I am. We are in an unfortunate state. God didn't promise everything in our life was going to be roses. I don't have to tell you that life is hard. The idea that, that God has a wonderful plan for you, that is a lie. God never promised this life to be wonderful. He does have a promise of a wonderful eternal life. And that promise, we know, we can have confidence that he will fulfill that promise to us. The element of time is hard to understand. As I'm getting older, time is going faster and faster. I'm 25 years old. To some of you, that's young. To some of you, that's old. But no matter the difference of age, we must know that that God is in control 
And things don't happen in our time. Go back to our verse in Jeremiah 29. In verse 11 we read, but look at verse 10. For thus says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God promised them peace. He had promised them hope. He had promised them welfare, which means health and happiness. Think about those promises. Those promises meant that God's people would be taken care of. But when? Seventy years are completed. Seventy years in exile. Some of these people wouldn't even be alive to see that promise. They would die in exile. Because things don't happen in our time, we need steadfastness and we need trust. To wait 70 years to see a promise fulfilled is literally a lifetime. In Psalm 90 and verse 10, the years of our life are 70. You wait 70 years for anything, and you're going to need patience. Go with me to the book of James. James chapter 1. Coming from the New King James Version, which is a, a version that I've been reading almost my entire life, to the ESV was in some ways an easy transition. In some ways it wasn't. One of those reasons it wasn't is because I love the book of James. And James changes the word of patience to something else. In James chapter 1, starting in verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. I have come to, to know and love that word. Steadfastness. It means loyalty in the face of trouble. The testing of your faith produces loyalty in the face of trouble. And let steadfastness have its full effect. Let loyalty have its full effect. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Peter wrote about steadfastness in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 6. For if these qualities and qualities that include steadfastness, qualities that include godly qualities, if they are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities steadfastness, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There are a lot of people here this morning. Most of you are members here. I look out and I see some visitors here. And I don't know every single detail of every single person in this room. But I don't have to in order to know at least one thing about you. I can guarantee you've asked for something in your life. You prayed to God, didn't you? And didn't I? You have fallen on your knees and said, Lord, give me this one thing. Give me this job. Give me a wife or husband. Lord, give me a baby. Do you have steadfastness? Do you have loyalty? Because sometimes... Sometimes God says, wait. Sometimes he just says, no. That is not an easy thing to understand. That's why we also need trust. We need steadfastness. But we also need trust. To trust in God and his will and his plan for us. Go back to Jeremiah 29. People in exile. Do you think they had steadfastness? 
Do you think that they had trust? Even if they did, they had to be reminded. Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage, that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. Verse 7. Seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile. What? And pray to the Lord on its behalf. Pray to the Lord on the behalf of Babylon. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. These people were in exile. They were in bondage. They were in slavery because of their own sins. They were marched from Jerusalem to Babylon. A city filled with sin. And now God is telling them to do something completely opposite of what they were thinking. He's basically telling them to live their life as if nothing has changed. To live in Babylon as if they were still living in Jerusalem. And not only just live there. Look at verse 7 again. To seek out opportunities for the city's own health and happiness. That is trust. That is absolute trust in God and his plan for us. What you think about being in exile for some time, though? It would be easy to forget God's promises. It would be easy to listen to somebody who has a better message for you and for me. And that's why we need to remember that you are not in control no matter what other people say. During this time, there were false prophets everywhere saying all kinds of things to draw attention to themselves, to draw people away from God. Jeremiah 29 Verse 8, For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you, and do not listen to the dreams that they dream. For it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. Just the chapter 4, chapter 28. Would you turn there with me? Jeremiah 28. There is this prophet Hananiah who was telling the entire nation an absolute brazen lie. Jeremiah 28, starting in verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. This man, this prophet Hananiah, is saying, I have broken the yoke. Within two years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place, and carried to Babylon. God told the prophets it was going to be 70 years. 70 years of captivity. And this man, this, this false prophet of God is coming and saying, no, it's not 70 years, it's only two. That sounds like pretty good news. Two years of captivity. It would be an easy choice between two years and 70. But later on that chapter... God goes to Jeremiah. Jeremiah tells Hananiah a message for God. In verse 15, And Jeremiah the prophet said to the prophet Hananiah, Listen, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you. You have made this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will remove you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because you have uttered rebellion against the Lord. Two months later, this man was dead. This false prophet of God died. It happened back then. It happened in the New Testament too. Romans 1, verses 21 and 22. For although they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks to Him. But they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. It happened all the way back there in the Old Testament, didn't it? It happened in the New Testament. And it didn't stop there. There are people all over this country who would rather shove down our throats their own beliefs and convictions without ever having a healthy discussion. If I, as a Christian, disagree with you and your lifestyle... 
I then, by logical conclusion, must hate you. That is a superficial attitude. If you know that I am a Christian, then ask me a question about my faith, and you disagree with what I have to say, who is being intolerant to who? We have to stand up for what we believe in. There is no sitting down anymore. There is no being comfortable in our seats. We have to stand out from the crowd. And our message may hurt. It may offend the other person. They may even seek your destruction. Seek the destruction of your career, your reputation, and your trust. Listen to me. We don't have to apologize for speaking the truth. We don't have to say, I'm sorry for telling you the truth of God's word. God never promised this life to be wonderful. It would be free of persecution if we lived a life faithful to him. The opposite is true. Second Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 16 reminds us of that fact. But that's why we need to remember that God loves you. He loves you. He loves this world. Jeremiah 29 and verse 11, there are plans for health. There are plans for, for happiness. There are plans for hope. This life of exile is not permanent. This life of separation from God does not last forever. We are broken and we are lost. Romans 7.24 again. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who is going to save me? Who is going to save you? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I deserve to die. You deserve to die for what you have done, for what I have done. But it's God's free gift. It's free. That's going to save me, it's going to save you because he loves us. 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. God is love. This is not the God that that was love or the God that will love. This is the God of love. Love is who he is. It is a part of him. And he didn't love us because we loved him first. He loved us first. Because of that great love, we have his son. His son died so that we didn't have to. He died so that we could know love. He died for you. He died for me. He died for that free gift of God, which is why we can say, give thanks to the Lord of hosts, for the Lord is good for his steadfast love endures forever. What a great God that we serve. You are not in control. That's not the entire story, is it? The title of this lesson. It's not entirely true. Because as you know and as I know, you and I, we are in control. We control a lot of things. Yes, ultimately God is in control, but that does not mean we should be sitting around being passive and waiting for things to happen for us. Sit around and think that God will take care of everything for me. That is false. Jeremiah chapter 29. 
starting in verse 12. This is the verse just after verse 11, which we read. Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 12, You will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. Does it sound like these people had a free pass? Do you think you have a free pass in this life? Look at that. They had to go to God. They had to pray to Him. They had to seek Him out. They had to find Him and go to Him. They had to be active in their faith to God. What makes you think you don't? The command of Jeremiah 29 in these verses sound like Mark 12.30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. They were so active in their disobedience to God, which is why they were in exile, why they were in this mess to start with. Just like them, we are in control of our obedience to God, or our disobedience to God. Could I encourage you to seek God? To find Him out, to love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength? Do not fall into the same trap of disobedience the Israelites did. In Ezekiel chapter 33 and verse 11, I have no pleasure, none. Listen to God. I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back. Turn back. For why will you die? God doesn't want you to perish. He wants to save you. He wants to save you. But why should I care about that? 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. That's why. This verse right here is why you should care about obedience. Can I encourage you to think about this year? Did you obey God in 2013? Will you obey God in 2014? 2013 is basically over. Whatever you did in the past, it's gone. Can I encourage you to not look back, but instead look forward? You control right now. You control right now whether or not you're going to obey God or disobey Him. If you are not a Christian, obedience begins with with repentance and being baptized. The water is ready. Why baptism? Because God commanded it. He commanded baptism. If God said it, that settles it. Man cannot change that. If you are a Christian, have not been living the kind of life that God can call an obedient life in 2013, why not start now? Why not let 2014 be the year when you serve God the way he wants you to serve him? We can't control the past. We can't control the future. We control right now. Would you choose to obey God right now? Would you please come right now and stand as we sing? Come down to the front to make your need known. Oh, listen to our wondrous story. How it was among the Lord. Yeah, what came down from heaven's glory.
to prepare our minds as we focus on the Lord's Supper. We will sing all four verses of number 671. He carried my sorrows from Isaiah 53, verses 3 and 4. Surely he has borne our griefs. He has carried our sorrows. He carried my soul. 